Good morning. Yeah, it's good to be here, isn't it? It's a smaller crew today, and that's okay. When we had the service, we knew that not everyone can make it, and so we want to welcome especially those who are listening by live stream or on KDCR as you're snuggled warm in your home. We pray that for each of us, whether we're in the presence of one another in the sanctuary or the presence of God in our own homes, that we experience a Sabbath blessing today. If you're wondering why we have church, I was getting texts all yesterday and even this morning from colleagues, you know, wondering what we were going to do, and I said, I answered back, you know, we're called the frozen chosen for a reason. <laughs> we really can't do anything about that. Um, this morning, even, I walked outside just in my basketball shorts, and uh, I was bareback, and I figured if I could go through the passage I just recited that we're going to preach on, if I made it through, we were going to have church. So maybe if we ever preach on Psalm 119, we wouldn't, but for this morning, it worked. And so we just pray that today we can be together on a very cold day, but a beautiful Sunday, this fourth Sunday of Advent, and worship a God who is with us. As we do, a couple of words of welcome, certainly to every guest who is here. We want to welcome you to this place. We also want to welcome anyone who's here for the baptism. We're going to be with the DeWeird and Fakus family celebrating the baptism of little Simon John this morning. And I also want to welcome, on behalf of our congregation, a new family who's joined us officially. So I'd like to invite the Hans up if they're here, as well as uh, Jessica Fakus, who will do the introduction. So if the Hans are here, and if, yes, there they are. So good morning, everybody. We are introducing um, the Han family. We have Mark and Kristen and their two little girls. Um, They recently moved here from the Spencer area. Um, Their two little girls are Brenna, who is three, and Julia, who is one. Um, Mark um, graduated from Dort and works at the IT department at American State Bank. And Kristen splits her time between the Orange City Hospital and the Sioux Center Hospital as a surgical med tech. In their spare time, Mark enjoys building and fixing things, and Kristen enjoys um, cooking and gardening. Um, We are just thankful that you have been called to Bethel. We just pray that you are surrounded by the community of believers and that you and your family can continue to grow here. So would you guys welcome, join me in welcoming the Han family. Welcome. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome to go back to your seat. As we welcome the Hans warmly, uh, and we welcome our guests warmly, we welcome those here for the baptism. There's also another person here today we're just welcoming back as a congregation. After a 10-month deployment, Wade Vandenberg is back with us, and we're so thankful to God for his safety over this past year and that we can celebrate with his family and as a family of faith that Wade is back with us today. Maybe if we do that, let's just give praise to God, too, for that glory. And to celebrate each of these things after the service this morning, we're going to have chocolate chip cookies, which were a favorite of Wade's, as to, to welcome all of these, uh, these, these people. So if you are listening by live stream and you can make it, I would come at around 11 because there will be cookies. So uh, with those words of welcome, just one other thing as we look forward to today. This evening is our Sunday School Christmas program. It'll start at 6. It's their normal Sunday evening service. But there'll be a prelude with a lot of our children giving the gift of music uh, to bless us, and that'll start at 540. So if you'd like, come at 540 this evening to hear those musical gifts before the 6 o'clock service begins. Also, by way of announcement, next week, Sunday night, uh, we're going to have, uh, or next week, Saturday night, we're going to have our Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m. So this Saturday, 5 p.m., come back here for a Christmas Eve candlelight service of Lessons and Carols followed by a Christmas morning service at 10 a.m. On, on Christmas morning. And just one final announcement, because of the cold, uh, the freshman and junior catechism classes will not be meeting today. So if you're a freshman or a junior, you're welcome to join the senior catechism class that we'll be meeting, but otherwise you won't have class yourself. With those words of announcement and welcome, let's open this service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you on a day in which the snow squeaks under our, the soles of our feet, and the world is clothed in white, and the air is crisp and clear, that you are the God who makes the seasons, both these bitterly cold winter mornings as well as the bright yellow-green of spring, the lush living life of summer, and even the colors of autumn. And Lord, that through all the seasons of this, these years and all the seasons of our lives, that we belong to you in life and in death. 
Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless each of us who are here today and those who are listening on radio or by live stream or on television. Lord, we thank you that as a body we can experience your presence, that where two or three are gathered, you promise to be with us. So Lord Emmanuel, we come to you today with our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship? Our call to worship, again, are those familiar words from Isaiah chapter 9 in this Advent season when we remember the fourth gift of Advent, the gift of peace. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We celebrate today that Prince of Peace and we do that with the songs of the angels who said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men and women on whom his favor rests. Let's sing that opening song. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 345. Friends, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, receive this greeting from God. To those who are called, who are beloved by God the Father and kept safe in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. On a very cold morning, would you please turn and give a very warm welcome to all around you this morning. Friends, you may be seated, and as you are, we'll have our Advent reading and lighting again. Light a candle on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We watch with eyes wide open. What does a shepherd know of peace? God's comfort, comforting word in a dark valley still heard. 
since Christ is our advent of peace. Please join us in singing, What Child Is This? Before Sunday of Advent, we hear a call to confession from this babe born of Mary who grew up to reveal himself and to speak these words from John chapter 10 as a call to confession. Jesus said, the man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opened the gates for him and the sheep listened to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. The voice of our shepherd today invites us to come to him honestly in confession. Let's follow him to that space. Would you pray with me? God, the good shepherd of our souls, we come to you on this final Sunday at Advent confessing how often we have not heeded your voice in this week. How often instead of following your voice, we have followed the seductive voices of temptation the loud voice of our own boastful pride, the cutting voices of gossip, the shrill voice of selfishness, the nagging voices of our addictions, the distracting voices of our busy culture. Heavenly Father, we've even followed at times the condemning voice of Satan himself. And so we all like sheep have gone astray and each of us in this week has turned to our own way. And yet, Heavenly Father, we thank you on this morning that in all our wandering, you are a God who searches us out. That you are still the God who calls us by name. That you are still the Lord who longs to gather the wandering lambs back into your arms. And that even as you carry us back home, you have laid on Christ our Savior the iniquity of us all. And so, Father, we pray that you would forgive each and every one of our sins. That you would give us ears to hear your voice of grace this morning. 
and also your voice of leading along new paths in this coming week. For Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Good Shepherd. Amen. Our words of God's promise to us come from that same passage in John chapter 10. Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish for no one can snatch them from my hand. And with that word of grace from our good shepherd, we respond to this by singing together, Good Shepherd of My Soul. This morning we have the privilege of witnessing that good shepherd gather one of the littlest lambs in our congregation into his arms through the sacrament of baptism. And we do this because that great shepherd of our souls, when he ascended from the grave and then ascended into heaven, said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, therefore go, make disciples of all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he gave a promise to that command, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. I will be your Emmanuel forever. In response to that command and in light of that promise, we baptize believers and their children. And this morning as we do, I want to remind us that baptism is a sign not just of that promise of Christ, but actually of the promise of God all through redemptive history. For the Lord God made this great promise to Abraham. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. In later years, even though those descendants were unfaithful, God renewed his promise through the prophet Jeremiah. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. In the fullness of time, God sent Jesus Christ to give pardon and peace through the blood of the cross, the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that resurrected Christ declares through the apostles, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Baptism is that seal and reminder of God's good promises. With that before us, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you again on a morning in which the waters around this building are frozen solid as ice and snow. Yet through the flowing waters in this space, you will once again flow with a promise. Heavenly Father, we thank you that that promise flows from the same stream of your voice that spoke this world into being that this promise flows from the current of redemptive history that parted the Red Sea and led your people from slavery into the promised land. That the promise that you speak to us today is the promise that you also spoke through the words of your son Jesus as he calmed the storm and delivered the disciples from death. Lord, once again, may your promise come and may you give us ears to hear. And once again, by the power of your spirit, may the water that we pour here be so marked by you that this little one is marked by your Holy Spirit as a child of the covenant. Heavenly Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite Dan and Samantha up. Yeah, we'll just gather here on the font. Simon's had a big week, uh, and uh, we're now going to hear God's promise to him, but before we do, I'd like to invite you to respond to four promises of your own. So first, Dan and Samantha, do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? What is your answer? Second, do you affirm the promises of God made to you and to your sons in his word, and affirm the truth of the Christian faith which is proclaimed in the Bible and taught in this church of Christ? What is your answer? Next, do you believe that your son, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? What is your answer? We do. Finally, this. Do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help and nurture of the church to instruct your son by word and example in the truth of God's word and in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? What is your answer? We do. So God comes to us through water. Oliver, it's very exciting. This actually happened to you not that many years ago. Are you touching? Yeah, you can touch it, yeah. It's just, just water, but through this water, God's going to promise something to your brother. Why are you yeah. Simon John DeWeird, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Simon John, child of the covenant I in baptism, you. you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Would you pray with us? Heavenly Father, in this season of Advent, we thank you for the remembrance of the names of this little one. Simon, the man who waited for the consolation of Israel and was able to see that coming in his lifetime. And John, the Baptist, who proclaimed the coming of Christ. Lord, we do not know if in the lifetime of this little one you will come again, and yet we commend him and this family into your strong hands. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would seal this, this child, that Simon, as he grows, would come to know the one who knows him already, or that you would give Dan and Samantha wisdom as they raise their two boys, that this family would experience your peace and your grace. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Congregation, would you please stand? We make a promise too. We receive Simon into Christ's church. Do you welcome him in love? And do you promise to continue to support him by word and example in his walk with Jesus Christ? Congregation, what is our answer? We do. God helping us.
Amen. Yeah. Congratulations. You may be seated, but I'd like to invite the choir up. As we are, congratulations. Yeah. Samantha. Oliver. And the choir is on singing together that uh, very familiar song, Jesus Loves Me.
Yeah. Thank you, choir. The Bible that tells us that Jesus loves us, that tells us the story of God's redeeming love is the same scripture we turn to now. I invite you to turn with me to the middle of our Bibles. Uh, we are going to be in Psalm chapter 23 today, the very well-known words of that psalm. And as we are, we're, we're walking through this Advent series where we're trying to see the coming of Christ through the eyes of shepherds. We've done that through the first shepherd in history, a man named Abel, who was murdered by his brother. His blood cried out then for justice and has through the ages, and yet the new shepherd comes whose blood speaks a better word, a word of mercy. We saw a second shepherd named Moses who tried to deliver the people of God in his own strength and was pushed out into the desert, but there he met the true deliverer in this covenantal love of God who would redeem his own people. Last week we met a third shepherd named David, this youngest boy who was unexpected and unlooked for to become king, and we yet saw in God's choosing of David a model of how God works in the world. And now this fourth Sunday of Advent, we have that third shepherd, David, singing a song. This is a psalm of David, and in this psalm, we'll meet the shepherd that's been working all through each of these stories. And as we do that, I'm going to pray, and then the first graders are going to actually recite our text for us this morning. They're going to recite Psalm 23, but first let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of every generation, a God that calls young and old to take your word on our lips and to hide it in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak to each of us today. Whatever burdens we bring into this place, whatever worries, whatever joys, that together we would gather around your word and that your word and spirit would do your work in us and then through, the, through us in this week. Father, we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 23. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, this past week, Tuesday, 10 days after the most deadly fire on U.S. soil in over a decade, police and firefighters, first responders, and Red Cross volunteers gathered at the Oakland Fire Station number 13. There, after forming a group, they made a procession down the road following a single bagpipe until they arrived at 31st Avenue where they gathered around the charred remains of a warehouse where that fire had happened. And while they're at that warehouse trying to bring some sense of closure to those who had struggled trying to rescue those who were hurt and also remove the bodies, as they gathered there, one of the firefighters told a bell 36 times, one peal for each of the victims. And after that was done and the silence settled, you need to say something. But what do you say in Oakland, California in the 21st century? What words do you have to comfort those grieving families and those whose lives are reeling in the wake of a tragedy? What in an urban culture that is post-Christian, what words can you possibly reach to to bring solace? Well, on Tuesday, in that gathering around the charred remains of a warehouse with smoke smell still in the air, the words that they read were the words of Psalm 23. Just yesterday, on Saturday, there was a funeral for a man named John Glenn, a man who flew 149 combat missions for the United States military, became the first U.S. astronaut to orbit the, around the, the, the Earth, also orbited again when he was 77 years old. In the interim, he was a Democratic senator from the state of Ohio. 
And in his funeral yesterday, there were dignitaries from all over the place, including Vice President Joe Biden, the head of NASA, the head of the Air and Space Museum. How do you commemorate someone who rocketed us into the space age? After an opening prayer, yesterday afternoon, the opening words were the words of Psalm 23. That today, as we go from one end of the country to another, as we commemorate the death of artists and astronauts, We 21st century urban Americans still reach back to this agrarian poem written in 10th century BC. And somehow we find in those words comfort. And the question is why? What is it about this ancient agrarian poem from a very distant land that still speaks to us today? What do we see in it? Well, I want to suggest maybe one answer to that is in this poem, what we see is a striking image of God. Certainly the iconic words that begin the poem, the Lord is my shepherd, are startling. They're startling because of the domestic way in which they approach God. This is the God of heaven and earth. This is the king of the universe. This is the Lord of the angel armies. Lord Sabadot is his name. And yet in this poem, we name him as one who has a simple earthly profession. The creator of the universe is shepherd. Now in saying this, David was not simply being innovative. It's not like in Psalm 23, David was for the first time realizing as he looked back at his own profession that God was kind of like him, that God was also a kind of a shepherd. And so David, for the first time, sees this connection. That's not what's happening in Psalm 23. Because actually, all the way through Scripture, God presents himself and is presented as a shepherd. So back at the very beginning, the first book in Genesis chapter 49, when a man named Jacob blesses his sons, he speaks of who this God is who's doing the blessing, and he says, the Lord is the shepherd, the rock of Israel. He calls God shepherd. And it's not just Psalm 23, a Psalm of David, actually all through the Psalms, including other ones written by different people, like Asaph, who wrote Psalm 80. He says, hear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. And then through the prophets in Ezekiel and in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, like Jeremiah 31, we have the same image. The Lord will watch over his flock like a shepherd. Again and again, God presents himself as a shepherd of his flock, as someone who cares for his people like a shepherd. And that's actually not just in the Bible, that's actually in the ancient Near East. We can see from writings from that time that other kings, not just gods, but kings would say that was how they ruled. So if you know, for example, in Egypt, and you look at the ancient mummies, this is, for example, the mummy of King Tut, what's he doing? Well, if you look at his arms, you see he's holding a rod, and then you see a shepherd's crook, a rod and a staff. So it's not just God who's a shepherd. Actually, ancient kings saw themselves as shepherds as well. And so why in the world would David say this striking image and why is it so important to us today? Well, I think it's not because it's innovative, but because what was innovative was how personal it was. Because David said that not only is God the shepherd of a nation or the shepherd of nations, that he was my shepherd, says David. That this shepherd who rules all things also rules me. The God who guides the world also guides me. And so in this poem, there are three statements that are I statements that tell of what the shepherding does. Because the Lord is my shepherd, says David, I lack nothing. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I will fear no evil. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a promise of God in a very personal way. In unpacking those things that are true about David because God is his shepherd, David describes a very vivid imagery of what God does so that these things are true. There, he can want nothing. He can live in abundance because God is the God who provides. And the image for that is God leads me beside green pastures. This image that I'm going to show you is an image of a pasture uh, in Israel. Okay, my wife is saying I don't have an image of that. I think we can imagine it, green pastures, these lush fields of glory. But it's not just that God provides food, he also leads beside quiet waters. This is a wadi in Israel where my wife and I hiked, and you see in that the green pastures, but also the quiet waters where sheep 
could be nourished. And David says, I have a God who provides like that. But it's not just the green pastures and the quiet waters. He also restores my soul. And here is, there's a green pasture, um, but also a place where you can be refreshed, where you can rest, where there is no danger. And then he says this God, like a shepherd, leads him in paths of righteousness. This is a path in Arbel, um, the next one, or not. Maybe the computer's frozen up too. He leads me beside quiet waters. He guides me in paths of righteousness. These are straight paths. You can see a path here on a rocky terrain. This is where still shepherds lead their sheep. This is a place that is straight and that is, near, that is good. But not just does God provide abundance, David says God also provides protection. And so even in the valley of the shadow of death, this is the sort of dangerous places where sheep would go, where they could fall, where flash floods could happen, where the sun was blocked out by shadow. He said, even in the shadow of death, God is with me. And then he moves to an image that's a little bit more like a host around a table, but it's also a shepherding image. He says, God also watches over me in such a way that he prepares a table. Now, tables in many languages is the high places where their shepherds would take their sheep in the summer months. And the shepherds would walk that and they would look for flowers like this that were actually poisonous to sheep. This is a white camma. If sheep eat it, they paralyze themselves. And they would pull out those enemies and prepare a table. And then also they would anoint their sheep's head with oil. Sheep were plagued by flies and larvae and so they would be put oil on their nostrils and in their ears to prevent this from happening. And so David says, I'm looking at what God does And God provides for me. God protects. God's blessings flow. And because I have that kind of a shepherd, I know that God is with me. So is this why we love this psalm? Do we love it because it gives us this image that God protects us? And I don't think that's necessarily fully it. Because the truth is, in Oakland or in Ohio yesterday, many of us don't know these images. We don't understand these images. I don't think we claim this psalm simply because of what it says about God. I think we hold to it because of what it says about us. That we may not understand fully what a shepherd does, but we understand a little bit about being sheep. About how sheep are dependent and how they are weak and how they are vulnerable. And by saying God is our shepherd, we're saying something about him, but we're also saying something about ourselves. And what we're saying is that we need protection. We're vulnerable. And so on September 11, 2001, a day that began with bright sunshine, but that ended with two tall buildings and piles of smoking rubble, and a gaping black hole in the Pentagon, and a deep scar in the fields of Pennsylvania. And at the end of that dreadful day, the President of the United States gathered around, gathered everyone around a screen And he sat alone at his desk and he looked right into the camera and he tried to find some words of comfort. And at the end of that speech, where did this president, the most powerful man in the world, reach? He reached back to say this. I could just paraphrase it. Um, That's the next one, Mary Jo. I guess that told is, I'll just read it. I'll just paraphrase. There we are. Tonight I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened, and I pray that they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In the midst of tragedy, when we feel vulnerable, our president reached back to these words. And in doing that, George Bush was actually doing what people have done throughout time, that this psalm echoes through the history of humanity. So Augustine, the great church father, called this the song of the martyrs. Oliver Cromwell, the great statesman of England, when he died, these were the last words on his lips. The great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, a brilliant man, said at one point that of all the books he read, the thing that thrilled his heart the most was Psalm 23. Another president, Abraham Lincoln, not addressing the tragedy of a nation, but a personal tragedy, used this psalm. One of his friends who uh, was with Lincoln when he was a young man working as a lawyer, Lincoln would have to often go to people's homes to get their last will and testament to signify it as a lawyer. And so he brought a friend along as a witness. 
And one day, this friend recalls of a widow lady who, after giving her last will, asked if Lincoln would please read Scripture. And Lincoln said, I'll do, I won't do that, but I'll do something better. And from his heart, Lincoln, just like our first graders, recited the words of Psalm 23. These words are deep in the hearts of people throughout the ages. And it's not just written on our hearts and memory, it's also written on the canvases of our artwork and in our films. And so in the time of slavery, the founder of the New York Metropolitan Art Museum painted a painting of a black slave with a blue coat probably signifying the Union Army in the midst of slavery and chaos and death. And he called that painting, The Lord is My Shepherd. In our day, artists still reach from this. And so the great John Wayne film, Rooster Cockburn, has Audrey Hepburn confronting her assailant and doing so not with weapons, but with the words of this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. The great film Titanic has Leonardo DiCaprio's character running on a sinking ship as musicians who've been playing music now in quiet recite the words of this psalm. These words are written on our hearts, they're written on the pages of our art, and they're also set to music. Psalm 23 has had settings done by everyone as diverse as Bach, to, um, to uh, Leonard Bernstein, to Coolio, to Kanye. Artists from all different walks of life draw from the words of this psalm. And again, why is that? And I think it's because in all of our walks of life, we recognize our own vulnerability. I've been your pastor for now over seven years, and I've stood by hospital bedsides and deathbeds, and I've stood with you in the funeral home and by the graveside. And more often than not, what we have gone in Scripture, among others, has been this psalm. Because in those moments when we know how exactly vulnerable we are, how close death is, how fragile is the human existence, that is when we reach for these words, these old words, These words that tell us that we are weak and yet there is someone who is strong. And in fact, if you look at the psalm and you look at the words that we typically go to, I think we see a pattern of what God's Spirit has shown us. Because look at the words that um, when Immanuel Kant quoted this psalm, it wasn't just anything. He said, and this was to a letter to a friend, I've read many intelligent and good books in my life but I did not find anything in them that would make my heart so quiet and glad like the four words from that 23rd Psalm, you are with me. And when Abraham Lincoln recited the Psalm from memory to that dying woman who actually died before they left, this is what his friend recorded. Lincoln began to recite from memory the words of Psalm 23, especially emphasizing the words, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And when George Bush recited that psalm or chose a portion of it in his speech on September 11, what part did he quote? Notice again, they'll be comforted with the words, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That those are the words that we cling to. And actually, they're the words that we were meant to cling to. At the beginning, the very first word in the psalm is the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. At the end, the last word is the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And if you line up the stanzas of the psalm and you look in the very middle, there's a line. And in fact, if you count the letters in Hebrew, there are 26 letters before the start of this line, and then counting backwards, there are 26 letters afterwards. What is the theological and literary heart of Psalm 23? The words, you are with me. At the very heart of the shepherd's psalm is the promise that God will be with us. At the very heart of Psalm 23 is the promise that God is Emmanuel, God with us. You could say at the very heart of Psalm 23 is Christmas. At the heart of this beloved psalm is the promise of Emmanuel, a God who will come in the shadow of death to be with us. And so Jesus comes as God incarnate, as Emmanuel. And he walks among his people. And he wants to describe himself. And what words, what image could Jesus use to convey what he's come to do? Well, in John 10, 10, we've heard these words already. He says, I am the good shepherd. 
And the Apostle Peter, who walked for three years with Jesus, observing his character and his actions, the way that he provided, and the way he gave security, and the way he gave blessing, when he tries to describe this Christ to a new people, what does he say in 1 Peter chapter 2? He calls him the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And then in chapter 5, he calls him the chief shepherd. When the author of Hebrews tries to write to a Jewish audience and describe who this God incarnate is, what does he use to describe him? Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. That Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, at the heart of the shepherd is a God who is with us. And the way we see that is because Psalm 23 follows Psalm 22. Psalm 22 are the words that Jesus would take on his lips as he, lay, as he hung dying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the way that Jesus could be with us in the shadow of death is because he went for us through the shadow of death. That at the heart of Psalm 23 is Christmas, but at the edge of the psalm is the cross. And that is why we have hope, even when we sense how vulnerable and weak we are. I'd like to close with a story by Kevin Adams from his book psalm, on the Psalms named 150. I found that book very helpful in thinking through this psalm. And in that, that chapter, he tells of Timothy Brown, who is now the head of Western Theological Seminary. But when Pastor Tim was much younger, he had a member of his congregation named Paul. And Paul was 20 years old and he loved to fly. It was, his passion was a family tradition. And so one day he rented a twin prop Cessna, Cessna airplane from the Tulip uh, Airport in Holland to fly up north along the coast of Lake Michigan to log hours for his pilot's license. He was to be back at midnight. But at midnight, there's no plane that arrived in the hangar. His family was a little angry. Why is he late? He should, have, he should be more on time. By one o'clock, they were worried. By two o'clock, they called the family and let them know that Paul's plane hadn't returned. At 4 a.m., they called the pastor, who threw on some clothes and joined them at the hangar. His family gathered by five in the morning a throng, and they waited and they waited. At about noon, FAA officials arrived in the parking lot, and the parents, Dennis and Sally, ran out and everyone, even 20 years later, can remember the scene as they heard the news that their son was dead, crashed into the water, covered by the sea, and watching them fall to their knees in the tarmac. When the parents came back in, they said to Pastor Tim, could you please pray for us? And so the family gathered around in a circle, interlocking arms because they didn't have the strength to stand. And in a moment like that, when you feel so vulnerable, what words do you say in the 21st century to urban people whose hearts have been ripped out? What words do you use? And Pastor Tim didn't try to bring words of his own. He reached back with Augustine and with Ambrose, and he reached to the words of the Psalm 23. And just like our first graders, he began to recite them from memory. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But as he got to that line, he was overcome with his own grief and he couldn't finish. And yet in that moment, Paul's father picked up the next line. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. But at that point, the father could speak no more. Maybe the image of quiet waters, knowing that his son had crashed under the waters of the Lake Michigan, were too much and he choked up. But then the mother of Paul, picked up on the next line and spoke about how he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. And at that point, the mother couldn't pray anymore. Maybe the images of having her little boy around a table making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or the image of a feast of a wedding that will no longer happen. She couldn't pray. But then Kevin Adams picks up the story and says this. Then the most remarkable thing of all happened. Every person in that circle of grief continued praying Psalm 23. With one communal voice, they continued the ancient words, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Until they came to the final line, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the face of immediate and overwhelming pain, they joined the ancient, never-ending chorus. 
They uttered words of trust tested for centuries in danger of falling apart. They turned to Psalm 23. And like steel girders holding a bridge upright through a violent hurricane, these words held them fast, assuring them that even in the valley of the shadow of death, fear would not have the last word. At the very moment their emotions spun in violent chaos, those familiar and trusting words held them together. The Lord is my shepherd. And at the heart of the shepherding, Emmanuel, God with us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We're in a world of war and death and cancer where we sense our fragility and our vulnerability, our weakness and our dependence. Lord, we thank you that the peace that we find does not come from our strength, but from knowing you as our shepherd. And not just knowing you as strong like the mighty kings of old, but as one who would walk with us as a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Heavenly Father, in this Advent season, may you remind us of this in all of our struggles that you are with us. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, and all of us say, amen. At the heart of the psalm, those words, you are with me, our song of response, that great old hymn, abide with me, fast falls the eventide. Let's stand to sing Psalter hymn number 442. seated. So we come to the shepherd of our souls. We bring him our lives in this world. As we do, we pray with Jean and Judy Vonk. They were in Mayo Clinic for most of this week. Doctors did remove some new cancer uh, from his esophagus, and so that was disappointing news, and he'll be going back again in three months to see if there's any more growth. Also, I continue to monitor his heart and, uh, and also uh, gave him an epidural on Friday morning for his back. And so we want to continue to pray for Gene and for Judy. Pray for Harold Vandekeef, who was taken to the hospital this weekend. 
Uh, he is doing better. I was able to eat supper last night. Maybe even could come home today. We want to continue to pray with Harold and Kathy. I just want to pray with Del and Lori Voss. We've been praying for their uh, brother-in-law, uh, Fred, and he did pass away this weekend. So we want to pray for that family in this time of holiday, and also a time of grief. And also, I just was told that Justin and Denise are here today. We've been praying for this family, and we're just so thankful that Justin could be here. We want to pray for them in this holiday season. With that, would you please pray with me? Gracious God, you are the Good Shepherd. And we acknowledge with joy and confidence today that we belong to you in life and in death, body and soul. Our faithful Savior and Shepherd, Emmanuel, we belong to you, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that we see your shepherding hand directing this world. And yet with David, we can also say that you are my shepherd, that you are individually watching over each of your children. Heavenly Father, as a community of faith, we thank you for the ways we've seen that in the welcome of Mark and Kristen and their daughters today. We thank you for the way that you've shepherded them through all the walk of their life and now that they can walk that journey of faith beside us. Lord, we pray for your blessing as together we build your kingdom, as together we encourage one another. May this family experience in this season of life the richness of your provision. Heavenly Father, we thank you with the Vandenberg family for Wade's safe return, that you are a God not just who provides, but a God who gives security, who walks us through the valleys of the shadow of death and even through this deployment and the difficulty of being separated as a family that you have reunited this family. Heavenly Father, we pray in these coming weeks through the transitions emotionally and, and schedule all the things that have to happen after a long deployment. We pray that you would walk beside them as a good shepherd. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the baptism of Simon John this morning and for your promises to this little one. We thank you with the Tinklenburg family for the births of healthy grandchildren and for the Hoagland family, Lord. We thank you especially for little Silas in this new life that we can welcome into our congregation in these days. Heavenly Father, we do also thank you in this season of Advent for the safety that you continue to give, and we pray in this very cold weather that you'd give safety to those who are traveling in the holiday season, to those who are working outside on farms and in construction and so many other jobs, Lord, that you would command your angels concerning us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the missionaries who bring this message of a good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. Lord, we thank you for the updates we've received from the Kuipers in this week. We thank you again for the work that you're doing with Josh and Joni as they transition back to work here. Heavenly Father, we thank you with the Sorens as they continue to minister in Costa Rica. Heavenly Father, we pray that in each context in ministry that you would give your peace. Father, we do pray for Pastor Vasi Miranda as they also bring your gospel in Ukraine, but especially now we pray that you would give healing to Miranda. Lord, as she struggles with hepatitis and even through an extended time of quarantine that seems to stretch ahead of this family, we pray that you would be strong, that they would know your rod and your staff that comforts. Heavenly Father, we pray for this same comfort for those in Egypt, our brothers and sisters, who last Sunday experienced a bombing attack in a church in Cairo. Lord, that you would lead them even this day as they grieve through this valley. Heavenly Father, we do, I do pray that you would continue now your healing, uh, even as we baptize Simon as he recovers from his surgery on Monday. But we thank you for a good report for Deb Fakus that she had on Wednesday, and we pray that you'll continue to bring good healing and, and, and strength to her. Lord, we thank you also for the chance that Elmer Kudum had to return to Sioux Center on Wednesday. We pray that you'll continue to walk him through his recovery. Gracious God, we do pray for Gene Vonk, and we pray that you would heal his body, both his heart, his cancer, even this ruptured herniated disc. Lord, we pray that your hand would rest strongly on Gene and Judy in this time. We thank you that Harold Vandekeef is improving, and we do pray that you would remove infection from his body, that you would give him strength, that you would help his heart to beat regularly, and that you would return him home. And yet we also thank you for the encouragement yesterday in a CT scan that his cancer seems to be responding well to his treatments. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would continue to give healing to Travis Mulder, to John Hoagland and Clara Hoagland, Lord, to Gerald Franken, to Stan Hock. Heavenly Father, that you continue to watch over the Haglin family, that you continue to be with those of us going through therapy, from surgeries and through, from conditions. We continue to pray, Lord, for Kurt de Koning as well. Heavenly Father, in this day, we pray for our youth, that you would especially watch over young people who are struggling with identity and with their place in your world. We pray that you especially would walk beside those of us struggling with addictions and issues with food, with alcohol, struggling with pornography. Lord, you know our struggles. 
And we pray that even in these dark valleys where we find ourselves, that we could look and see that you are with us, leading us out. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you especially walk beside those who grieve. We pray for Del and Lori and for Bev, especially in this time as they grieve the loss of Fred and this family. Heavenly Father, we do also pray with Jeff and Jamie Van Vorst as they grieve the loss of Jamie's grandmother, Anna Mae Van Serksum. We pray that as they prepare for a funeral next week, Thursday, that for both of these families, you would walk beside them. So Father, receive our prayers, receive also our offerings as acts of faith, as those who know our dependence on you and those who find gladness in this trust. For we offer these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We bring our gifts and our offerings to the Lord in this fourth Sunday of Advent, first for the ministries of this church, second for Christian education. And as we do, we're going to hear on this Sunday of peace the, the familiar song, uh, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet their songs repeat Of peace on earth, good will to men And the bells are ringing the choir they're singing in my heart I hear them peace on earth good will to men and in despair I bowed my head there is no peace on earth, I said For hate is strong and mocks the song Of peace on earth, good will to men And the bells are ringing Like a choir they're singing does anybody hear them? Peace on earth, good will to men. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. shall fail the right prevail with peace on earth good will to men then ringing singing on its way the world revolved from night to day a voice, a chime, a chant sublime Of peace on earth, good will to men And the bells they're ringing Like a choir they're singing And with our hearts we'll hear them on earth good will to men do you hear the bells they're ringing the life the angels singing open up your heart and hear them peace on earth good will Peace on earth, peace 
As we finish the service, just a reminder tonight, the prelude starts at 5.40, service at 6. This Saturday, our candlelight service for Christmas Eve will be at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary. Christmas morning, 10 a.m. on Sunday, this coming Sunday, Christmas morning. Also, just a reminder to greet and to congratulate the DeWeird family. Also, Wade and Denise, as we celebrate with them this day, and the Han family as well. There are chocolate chip cookies. Again, if you're listening by... Uh, radio, this is the time to come to church. Um, we're almost done. So with that, I'd like to invite you to stand for our parting blessing. And then after that parting blessing, our closing song, as we look to our shepherd, is we receive your blessings, we receive your grace. Let's do that now. Friends, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you this great shepherd is faithful. And he will do it. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.